Hello and welcome to the next exciting episode of Pulp Today. I have a guest with me today. I think he's above me. I don't know how it'll record, but Andrew Peepoy, ladies and gentlemen, comic Hi there. creator, um, worked with Archie a lot, Archie Comics, uh, Die, Die, Kitty. Am I getting that title right? Uh, Die, Kitty, Die, Die uh, which Kitty is one of the things I'm working on right now with Dan Parent. Excellent. Um, and great, yeah, also, and great book. Yeah, you know, pro probably best known for, uh, I was on Fables for 10 years at DC Comics. Right. And uh, I worked on the Simpsons comics for about 18 years. So nice. uh, nice. been doing this a lot, 30 years. Over, over, over at Bongo, I remember the first time I saw them set up at a con and I was like, oh, those are going to be good. <laughs> oh, they were. That was, that was, yeah. that, it was so much fun working for them. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about, you wanted to talk about the spider. Yeah. How did you discover the spider and, and, and what was your first exposure to it? Well, I mean, um, I first heard about pulps when I was a little kid um, in mentions in like pro probably some little, it wasn't an overstreet price guide, but I remember, you know, probably in the late 70s, my parents bought me some little other comics price guide and it also mentioned pulps. And I'm like, what are these things? And, uh, you know, saw the pictures. And I, I was one of those, you know, I was one of the little kids who didn't just go out and buy the latest issue of Superman and Daredevil. I, I was the kid who went to the library and, and, sat there since you couldn't check it out it was a reference book the entire world uh world history whatever it was the world encyclopedia of comics by maurice horn and mm. anything else i could find so i kept here you know and one of the things i would he i heard about other than just the old comics were these things called the pulps and i was lucky enough one day to stumble across uh some of the shadow and doc savage and avenger reprints in a used bookstore when i you know when my aunt and uncle took me to the uh the the, the used bookstore in the big city of grand rapids michigan because i was in Ooh. a yeah, I was, in, I was in a small. I was in a small town, so and these yeah. would have been the Bantam reprints, right? right the right, paperback, right. yeah, right. But certainly, certainly wasn't finding the spider. But um, yeah. but in some ways, the pulps became almost more appealing at that point because when I got home with them, my mom was like, "Oh, you shouldn't have let your aunt buy all those all those for you," and she made me like go and sell them back to the bookstore. <laughs> so, so suddenly, pulps became the thing I wasn't allowed to have, and, right. You know, so so um, the you know, pulps so are sexier were... and more violent than comic books. Your mom, I guess. your mom apparently knew. I don't know, but uh, some somehow you know those were the things I wasn't supposed to have. So you know, it of course became the thing I wanted to find. Sure. And um, certainly when I was, I'm like so the spider I had heard of, but never had found anything for until uh, the summer of 1985 when I was 16 years old and. I went to the uh, Chicago Comic Con that year. I drove, you know, I, that was back in the days when your parents, your parents would let your 16-year-old kid hop in a car and drive for three hours by himself and go to a comic book convention in a big city. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, and right there, as soon as you walked in, the, sh the show the show was co-owned at the time by uh, Robert Weinberg. Do you know mm -hmm. who Robert Weinberg was? Yeah. And so, and so, of course, being Bob Wein, you know, partially Bob Weinberg's show, he was right there at the entrance to the show and had a display of pulps and other science fiction type things. And right there on the table were, uh, they had just done these spider paperbacks uh, of some of the early spider stories, including uh, one that I know, you know, you've, you've talked about, Corpse Cargo, which I think was your, your dad's, was your dad's favorite. It was one of his top 10, I think. And this mm -hmm. is, I have the reprint, the more recent reprint. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been going through it. And it's, it is typically crazy stuff, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it only gets crazier. And that was the thing. So, so I enjoyed, I, I, I picked up what I could there at that show. And, but those were, they only did three books. So I didn't really have access to yeah. more spider stuff. So uh, I, I managed to find a few other reprints over the years. But yeah, it wasn't really until I uh, got into the comics business and actually started making a living and had some spending money that uh, uh, I, I, you know, went and, and waste, you know, went, yeah, there you go. Some of the actual pulps, yeah. Satan's Death Blast, another favorite. Mm -hmm. Another good one, yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so in the early 90s when I started making some money and I was getting royalties off the X-Men and stuff like that, I, I went to a pulp show and someone had a near complete set of the spider in a bound set. Wow. And I bought it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's impressive. Yeah, so I was I, I, I was like, wow, I've actually got all these spider pulps. I mean, I've I've since sold the uh, the, the bound set and, and just have other reprints now. But uh, um, but yeah, I was so I was like at that time I decided I'm going to read the entire run of the spider, 
But of course, you know, you get busy with other things and, sure. and you have other things to read as well. There's so much to read, so little time to read. And what's so, the, and I mean, the entire run of the spider is how was 150? I mean, how many novels? No, no, it? not even that, maybe 113, 14, okay. something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it wasn't as crazy as Doc Savage or The Shadow, which ran for right. 30 years, you know, 20, 20 years. Yeah, I mean, The Shadow is like 300 some novels. Yeah, I, yeah. I had a crazy idea of reading the entire run of that, and, and that'll never happen in my lifetime yeah. either. But, uh, but I'm enjoying The Spider. I, I've, you know, I still make sure I read, you know, a couple spider novels a year, uh, at least, um, fitting it in, in, in with my other reading. And so, uh, yeah, I'm still working on it. I'm up to volume 26 at this, at this recent date. Nice. Um, with the, the wonderful title of Death Reign of the Vampire King. Yeah, but a, that, which is an amazing title. Isn't it? Um, Isn't it? <laughs> you know, they're they're always so. Uh, there's, they you know, it's not an original observation, but they're they're so passionate and insane, uh, and that's true of most of the the bet the better pulps, I would say. Right. And the right. spider, I mean, like, look, the okay. spider comes in in thirty three, and he's m not very. Uh, what's the word? Not the world's most subtle. Uh, take on the shadow <laughs> uh, no 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 he does follow the shadow for a different publisher um but what's different is strikingly different and insane i mean he's certainly right. um i often for the sake of simplicity talk about how how much batman gets from the shadow but he gets a lot from the spider he also gets a lot from Do the gadgetry is a doc savage thing more right. than it's a, a shadow thing but he right. gets like, the look, look he gets the being terrifying part from the spider mostly. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, like most people are more familiar with the shadow, even if they're yeah. not, you know, a, a big pulp reader. And so the description I usually give to people to give them a comparison of, you know, the shadow versus the spider and, and how crazy it is, is that like in, in the shadow, the bad guys might blow up an entire office building. While in the spider, the bad guys will wipe out an entire Midwestern state. Yeah. You know, or in the shadow, the shadow might single-handedly be able to wipe out the supervillain and his entire gang of criminals. While in the spider, the spider, while, you know, having been shot 17 times, poisoned, you know, blind in one eye, you know, barely hanging on, will single-handedly wipe out an entire marching army of the undead. Yeah. Yeah. You know. No, it's that... <laughs> so that and and I love that I love that aspect of it. The, you know, the the operator fives are also like that, where uh, there's a right. different invasion of the United States of America twice a month, right? And whole cities right. are wiped out, millions die, and then next month we do it all over again. Uh, right. that, that was that was how popular publications did yeah. their their things versus say Street and Smith. Yeah. All, all oh, and. Like, I, and, and or like, uh, you know, popular publications had their own little, very short-lived knockoff of Doc Savage that's a lot of fun, called Captain Satan. Oh, sure. Yeah. And I've never Captain read a Captain Satan. There's a, there's a great cover of mm -hmm. the character with a Tommy gun that I still remember to this day. I can't remember where I saw it, but yeah. yeah the, first, the first three are good. The last couple, eh, not so much. But, yeah. it, but it's like, yeah, I mean, again, in the sort of, you know, Doc Savage versus Captain Satan. I mean, one of my, my favorite things, you know, just to, just to sort of show the, the weird take they took is that, you know, Doc Savage is always so noble and has his band of assistants who are always helping him and are all so noble. Right. And in, the, in, in Captain Satan, Captain Satan will go to whatever lengths, what, whatever lengths he has to, to, to win and beat the bad guy. And in every adventure, you know, one of his companions will die a horrible, gruesome death. Um, and so there, there's a lot of turnover in his group. I was going to say, <laughs> so he must have a lot of turnover in the, in the gang. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's kind of surprising, honestly, that that never occurred to Lester Dent. Uh, because as much as I enjoy Doc's characters, and I, I had the opportunity to write a Doc Savage thing, and it was a great joy. But uh, making those five guys distinct from one another is a trick. People tend to focus on Monk and Ham, Spock and McCoy, for want of a mm -hmm. better word, of the Doc Savage team. But the other three guys are just vaguely different versions of the same kind of scientist. And it's, it is a stretch. I worked very, the hardest I worked on that series was making them five distinct personalities. Um, and it, it is a little surprising that at no point did Dent go, you know what, let me just kill Johnny. 
I could just, we can swap some, we can bring another white guy in. Like we, we, you know, there's an endless supply of these guys in the world. He never tried to up the stakes. It's always that classic reset at the end of the story that we grew up with on television and even in things that were supposed to be sort of serialized. There was still that big reset next week. Uh, and of all the things, I'm not an, I'm, I'm 50, 50 on the over serialization of things. Now I think it would be nice if, someone occasionally picked up a comic book that ended when it was done. Right. And that began at a beginning and they could like maybe not have to have read 300 other titles to understand what was going on. But uh, I do think that it's kind of good that if you did City on the Edge of Forever on Star Trek now, next week Captain Kirk would get to be sad about it. <laughs> Instead of just going, <laughs> nope, completely life-changing traumatic experience, laugh seven days ago, completely out of my head right now, not paying right. anything. Right. But uh, anyway, let's, let's read. What's the, what have you got for us? Well, I mean, originally I had planned on reading uh, to you from Death Reign of the Vampire King, but as I was looking through it, I realized that the power of Norval Page in his writing in this had, like, there, there were some interesting Part, really good parts in here. This was a lot of fun to read, but it was, as I was looking for a good single passage to read, I realized that he evoked such, you know, imagery and ideas in me that I thought, oh, you know, that, 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 that I'm going to find this great passage that I can use for this. And it turns out there's all sorts of little bits here and there that built it. Right. And, and so he really constructed it well, but I couldn't find a great passage for today that would get right. you the idea of the spider across. Um, which is why I pulled out one that I read not that long ago called Overlord of the Damned. Nice. Um, which was uh, one, one of the early pulp reprints, again, done by Bob Weinberg, uh, like back in, when, when was this? Uh, did, he did this about 1980, it looks like. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, um, and in this, again, it's, it, it, there, there is a, I mean, I know it's, it's weird to be sort of, gleeful about the gruesomeness but it but but that's part of what made the pulp so fun no, in absolutely. some cases yeah, yeah. and and um and like i don't think you know um uh you know walter gibson would have done anything as gruesome as this in a shadow novel i mean i i mean i haven't you know i've, I've again i've i've only you know I've, I've only read about 50 shadow novels, but you know, I, as opposed to all out of all 300. That's a good, of them. That's a good cross section, I think, in terms mm -hmm. of getting a sense of what they are and what they're about. Right. But, uh, um, you know, but, I, but in, in this one, yeah, the, uh, the, the bad guys are armed with acid guns. <laughs> and, and so, um, okay. So the one thing the, you know, as I read this, the, the, the listener needs to know is that, the, the spider's real name is uh, Richard Wentworth and, uh, or Dick Wentworth as he goes by sometimes. So, uh, and, and so in this, I mean, I don't know how long do you want me to read for a little bit here? Oh, just a page or two, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get the sense so, of it, find, so, find you know, a good stopping point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm gonna read one little bit and then I'm gonna skip ahead to one little continuation on the same scene. But okay. it's like, okay, so this, to set it up, the spider is in the bank but the spider has somehow suspect, has suspected that some of these guys in the bank are criminals. So I'll, I'll start here. Swiftly, Wentworth scanned the bank, spotted an official he knew, Henry Hammerstein, a vice president, and hurried after him. He must warn the bank right away, for there could be no doubt what threatened here. Robbery certain, and there was the menace of the acid. Of course, exclamation point. <laughs> um, Wentworth fought to make his advance nonchalant. He must reach Hammerstein without alarming the crooks. Then he could return and dot, dot, dot. Across the lobby, Hammerstein reached the door of his private office, went inside, left the portal shut behind him, and dot, dot, dot. There was a sharp scream. Wentworth felt a freezing knife of horror slide along his nerves. His whole body knotted with tense muscles. The scream that came from behind that door of Hammerstein's office uh, to beat on shrieking eardrums was a sound beyond belief piercing and hoarse, frightened with insupportable agony and fear. Paralysis gripped the entire bank. Men and woman, women stood motionless, white-faced, silent. No one moved. That is, except the three men Wentworth had spotted previously. At the first shrill toxin of that scream, the three whipped strange, big-barreled guns from their coats and moved together toward the outer doors. The scream continued as if it would never cease. Now we scroll down to the, uh, the next uh, little, uh, little bit here. 
where Wentworth uh, then sees the frosted panel broke from the door of Hammerstein's office and out through the jagged opening, reeling with agonized hands thrust before him, staggered a man without a face. <laughs> you know, if a man can ever be said to be prepared for horror, Wentworth was ready for the sight that met his eye, was ready for the sight that met his eyes. Those screams that recorded the unutterable agony of tortured flesh and the memory of those men who had died before, faceless because of the liquid flame of acid was in his mind. Yet with a dazed feeling of utter incredulity that Wentworth recognized this fumbling thing as the man whom a few moments before he had intended warning of the disaster. And, um, you know, I'm scrolling down uh, to this, this other part. The spider has uh, um, uh, gotten some, some uh, equipment so that he can continue to battle these guys. And he's, come, he's left the bank, come back to the bank, Somehow the bank robbery is still going on. And um, uh, he's now wearing protective gear. Wentworth moved heavily toward the bank, sick with the realization of the toll of carnage. His eyes had the cold blue-gray grint of glacial ice. His face was, a, was rock hard. He went to the door, glanced over the floor of the bank. No, there was no one here he could help. No enemy to kill. They had all been killed, slaughtered. A shudder that came from the roots of his soul swept over Wentworth. There were fully 20 bodies on the floor terribly eaten with the acid. Some that had been hit repeatedly could scarcely be called bodies. Wentworth strode resolutely forward and his boots slipped and skidded in what was on the floor. The thinning of his lips turned, turned them white. He fought down a nausea that pounded at his stomach. You know, and it's just that kind of fun gruesomeness is what sort of made the spider, you know. Absolutely. And, it, you know, I, I tried to write something about this when I wrote about Doc Savage. I may, I did a little prelude that I was kind of proud of because I really wanted people to understand that all of these stories are perched between the two world wars. They're after the depression. I mean, in the case of 33, they're just, just crawling hands and knees out of the depression. And it's, it's a horror that, you know, that, the horror of war wasn't really a thing you read about, learned, you know, Matthew Brady took pictures, still pictures of dead bodies. And I think post-World War I, mass culture, it starts to sort of seep out the horror of the trenches, the horror of World War, the horror of machine guns and chemical weapons and flamethrowers. And I feel like all of that is in these stories. Uh, they're not war stories, but all of the horror of World War I is kind of packed into them, and the dread of World War II is on the horizon of them. And I don't think you can really, you can't extricate them from that time in that sense. I mean, you can do hero stories any, any time. Obviously, Superman has made his way out of the, out of the 30s just fine. Uh, but there's something about that whole feeling of anything is possible and anything can happen. Uh, any nightmare horror. I always, right. I always talk about it, but uh, one of my favorite pieces of screenwriting ever is the adaptation of Goldfinger. And the fact that there's a scene in it where Sean Connery tells Goldfinger the plot of the book and Goldfinger says, we're not, that's silly. We're not doing that. We're doing a thing with an atomic bomb. It's going to be totally awesome. But as part of that scene, Bond says you'll you'll kill you'll kill thirty thousand people needlessly or sixty thousand or whatever statistic he throws out, and Goldfinger says American motorists kill that many every two years. And there's just something so great about the twentieth century nihilism of Goldfinger, who's saying, after the Holocaust, we're going to quibble about sixty thousand people. Are you kidding me? Like that's not even a real, you know. Get back to me when I'm pulling Stalin numbers, man. When I'm pulling Mao numbers, 60,000 people, what even is that? All that to say, just that feeling of that 20th century mid-war nihilism is a hell of a drug and it's all over the pulps. And even more so, as you were saying, in the popular pulps, which are competing with their hair breadth, classier uh, brethren over at Street and Smith. Right, yeah, and no, Street and Smith, I think, you know, would de definitely, you know, those, those were tended to be a little more well-written, but a little less over the top, Yeah, you know, uh, while, while popular did not necessarily, you know, the, 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 they were way over the top most of the time, 
Uh, but you know, usually, usually there could be some, you know, like a, the spider is known for its gaping plot holes here and there. Sure. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know, for, for me, uh, sure, I enjoy a well-written book, but sometimes I just want the fun and the, and the, and the, 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 the ridiculous adventure. You know, so. Oh, absolutely. There's something to be said for, and I think that as comic book, I think comic book people have more in common with pulp than any, than any other art form in the sense that we are on an assembly line, especially on a monthly book. Oh, yeah. You are grinding out story, 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 event, 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 plot, event, plot, and uh, that pressure to just keep the thing moving and the ultimate fear is being dull. Never be dull. Never go eight pages about someone socking somebody in the mouth or, you know, the Raymond Chandler thing. When you run out of story ideas, find a new dead body. Find right. a new dead body or have a guy walk into a room. New character with a gun walks into the room or find a dead body. And sometimes you read like early Raymond Chandler and you go, wow, can I see the seams on this thing where he literally just went, I don't know where I'm at. Here's a body. <laughs> mm -hmm. like, he wasn't kidding. He really did just sometimes have, oh, here's a guy in a hat with a gun who just walked in and now we got to figure out his whole deal. And that'll, that'll, that'll add five pages to this thing. And mm -hmm. we're almost done. Right. And um, a penny word, you know, that's, yeah. that's a... <laughs> no, absolutely. And you can see that influence. Um, and I'll read this piece now. Uh, you can see that influence on my dad's work. I mean, he wrote about 200 published novels. Uh, was prided himself on his speed, even though a lot of writers look down on the idea of speed. You know, dad always thought of that, you know, the guy sitting in his uh, expensive library crafting one perfect sentence every three weeks as like, how do you, who is that guy and how does he do it? Like, I don't, who has that kind of patience, you know? Um, but I found looking around this morning, this, uh, mag this, zine from the 80s back when there was no internet and if we wanted to have these pop culture conversations we had to do them at cons or in self-printed magazine form there were a lot of these i have probably a couple of hundred of them that dad contributed to just because this originally ran in the 1981 june 1981 issue of mike shane mystery magazine the spider master of man by michael avaloni how much is richard wentworth all the world to me this man in January of 1934, I crossed the street to Mrs. DeSalvo's candy store and bought a copy of Sky Fighters with the thin dime my brother Nick had given me to start reading. But I, took, I turned back halfway across the trolley car track to Tremont Avenue. Another cover had caught my young, impressionable eye. Empire of Doom was the title under a crooked yellow logo which proclaimed the Spider magazine, fittingly headed by the legend Master of Men. Mrs. DeSalvo let me swap. That afternoon and all the afternoons and evenings and dreams thereafter, I was unalterably hooked. The fighter, the hero, the extraordinary human being was Richard Wentworth, playboy millionaire by day and cape crusader by night or when anybody, whenever anybody needed him. Master of disguise, superbly conditioned body, keen, alert brain, and altogether hair-trigger personality when the United States and the world was threatened by master villains, horrible hordes, devastating plagues, and killing, chilling terrorism. Wentworth, who became the cragged, grotesque spider who left his vermilion trademark on the dead foreheads of the enemy. Wentworth, with the incomparable Nita Van Sloan, loveliest heroine in all pulpdom, with the dauntless Ram Singh, long-suffering but true friend, Commissioner Stanley Kirkpatrick of the New York Police Department, and Apollo, the Great Dane, a character in his own furry right. God bless them all. We had read their prototypes before, but never with such heart, feeling, and emotion as Grant Stor Stockbridge, Norval Page, in truth, poured into the monthly exploits. And all through the 30s, there were titles and adventures and action-packed wondrous tales to conjure with. The Wheel of Death, The Serpent of Destruction, City of Flaming Shadows, The Mad Horde, The Citadel of Hell, The Corpse Cargo, Prince of the Red Looters. What a wealth of excitement and suspense and glory their melodious labels foretell. It was purple prose as its most extravagant, word magic at the, its zenith of impact. Why, damn it, the Batman was laughing, laughing. That's actually, the Batman is a character from a spider novel. The right. shadow could never have been so subjective. Bedlam reigned, leaden messengers of death rocketed across the room, 
Wentworth bunched his muscles and tightened his nerve strings, and the plane was a tiny dot in the roseate sky of a new day. And Abalone was inoculated forever. More than Poe, O. Henry, Dumas, Sabatini, Hemingway, and or For Fornal, no Norval Page is the most man most responsible for Michael Abalone, writer. So that's the that's a little something he wrote. And you met my dad, I think you told me. I, that I did, yeah. I mean, it, it was only for a, a moment or two, but he was a guest at uh, one of the local pulp shows here in Chicago a number of years ago. And I remember, I remember, you know, meeting him briefly there at the show. Um, Very nice. Like I said, I can't, I can't, can't say I had a great, you know, like any long conversation with him. It was just more of a, a brief introduction of, oh, Andrew, sure. I, thought, I thought you'd like to meet our special guest here. You know, and you mentioned the Batman that he mentioned. Yes, that is the character from the uh, book I mentioned earlier, The Death Reign of the Vampire King. And what year is that? Because that's got to be like a minute before the Batman is a, mm, in detective. 19th, uh, it was originally published in November 1935. So a, is that a year before yeah. Batman? No, that would be uh, four, year, four years. Four years. Four years, right, because he's right. Right. I sometimes confuse the release dates of him and uh, Action Comics, but that's still, uh, you know, there are a lot of, it's just like the spider. There are only so many names, only so many animals. Uh, the hardest thing in the world is to come up with a superhero name that no one has actually ever uh, trod right. upon before. But uh, but yeah, uh, you have coming up, or actually it's at the time this is going to play, it'll be out now, a Kickstarter yes. for your comic. Tell us about that comic. Okay, well, um, my favorite, you know, I've been doing comics now for uh, over 30 years. But my very favorite comic that I've ever worked on is my own original, The Adventures <coughs> excuse me, of Simone and Ajax. Right. Uh, the sort of zany adventures of a 20-something girl and her best pal, a small three-foot-tall cartoony-looking dinosaur. And uh, this, this is the last collection I did to them from, uh, came out from IDW about 10 years ago. Right. And I've been wanting to return to them for a while and uh, have been sort of laying the groundwork for, for a bit. And finally, the... You know, pandemic led to me definitely having the time to um, sit down and finally uh, finish this book. I mean, uh, so yes, so I'm doing an all new 128 page uh, collection of Simone and Ajax, uh, four stories. Uh, in in some ways, uh, you know, sort of some of the the, the favorite, you know, you know. Uh, genres you'd find in pulps uh, in sure. this one as well. Uh, you know, the, the first story in it is a pirate adventure, and certainly there were pirates in, in the old pulp adventure and sure. Odyssey and even, and even pirate stories. There's a tale of Simone and Ajax in the Old West, and then there's a story of them going to Transylvania and meeting a vampire and a werewolf and a Frankenstein monster, and what else could happen? We'll see. <laughs> and, and, then I, and then I close it with a hard, uh, with, with an Ajax hard-boiled private eye story. I've done several of these in the past. People always like them. You know, Ajax, you know, walks around his little, his little detective hat and narrates his adventures as he's going along with, with all, you know, as much alliteration as I can come up sure. with in some of that stuff, you know. Sure. Um, and, uh, and I just, I have, I have so much fun, I had so much fun writing that one just a couple weeks ago. So, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's on Kickstarter. Uh, you'll get this entire book, all four stories. Uh, you can also, it'll be available in both print and digital editions. Nice. Uh, just, just, it's, um, it's, it's better than, it's better than halfway done at this point. So just Great. so people aren't sitting here thinking, oh, well, he's got this idea, but is he actually going to come through? Well, sure. I'd like to hope that my 30 years of actually like making <laughs> comics and showing people I can meet a deadline will, will, will help convince them to put some faith in me. But also I wanted to show them that I've made some effort. So yes, right. I, I have, I have written and thumbnailed all hundred some pages of comics. Uh, I have drawn over half of it. The colorist, Jason Malay has colored about half of it. Um, and uh, besides the comics, there'll also be a little section in the back with a lot of rare and, and uh, previously unseen Simone and Ajax art that I've done for different things to give, to give them some, some bonus stuff. And uh, while, while as of this recording, I don't have the actual link to the Kickstarter to give everybody. I will I put will... it in the uh, descriptions wherever this posts. Great, but you I'll also- get it to me I'll... by then. Definitely will, as soon as I know it. But in, in the meantime, I mean, if just so if, if, if anyone wants to check out my work and also know where you'll easily be able to find that link come, uh, the, it should be live as of September 14th, if all goes well, you can go to my own website, uh, www.ppoy.com, -E or Simone and Ajax's own website, 
uh, www.simoneandajax.com and it's Simone with an E at the end. So um, I'll, I'll definitely like make sure the first thing you'll see when you go to either of those as soon as this goes live is the link to take you right to the Kickstarter. Nice. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping people will check it out. You know, if they're looking it for looks anything. great. I can, I can say to anyone listening, watching, I've seen at least half of it, I feel like. Uh, and yeah, I, looks, I, think I've, I think I've sent you half of it, yeah. Yeah, I, even, I, I know the last thing I looked at had you know, layouts in it uh, mm -hmm. and wasn't uh, finished pages, but there were a lot of finished pages and it looks fantastic. It's very funny, it's very sweet. Um, it's a perfect thing to apply your style and your worldview to. So uh, people should check it out, definitely. Yeah, I hope they will. I mean, you know, it's like, I mean, if, if, if they're, you know, if they're not familiar with Simone and Ajax, I mean, it's been you know, like one guy compared it to the, the my, one of my favorite lines I ever got on it was the look of an Archie comic, but the sensibilities of a Marx Brothers movie. Sure. And, and you know, and it's been compared to Bone, it's been compared to Carl Barks, Uncle Scrooge stuff. Uh, so, you know, if you like any of that kind of things and you just want a fun comic, hopefully this is something you'll like. Yeah, no, it reminds me of a lot of my favorite stuff. And it's, uh, it's very, very entertaining. And like I said, it's very, it's, uh, it's sweet, you know, and there, that's yeah. a, that's a good thing for things. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, to, I'm, I'm a fan to, of that. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to make it, you know, relatively all ages so that a kid can read it and have a good time. But I'll also mention that like I, in some of the stories, I'll try to write like an, an extra little level in there where the adults sure. will, will get it as well. And, and get, getting back to a point you mentioned earlier, where it's like, you know, you don't have to read 3000 issues to understand what's going on. Right. I try to make each of the stories relatively self-contained yeah so that quickly in the first few pages you you know even if you've never read anything else with them before in the first few pages you get the the gist of what the characters are about yeah. you don't have to have read them before and you can just have a good time reading the comic and it's almost better not knowing where they met and how why she's running around with the dinosaur at all times I have actually told that story. Before. Oh, I know, I know you have. It, it's just one of those things where I kind of actually like the that we are asked to accept at face value, right? The pretty girl with the with the pet dinosaur running around without any kind of like what the hell. Uh, yeah. to, I, 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 the casual acceptance of the absurd is one of the, is one of my favorite things in uh, in comedy specifically, but in in art in general, it's kind of a nice. Uh, you know, the, I always feel like one of the most boring scenes in the world to write is the what's going on, I don't understand scene. And the fastest you can get past that, mm -hmm. uh, the better. But, right, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't ever, you know, explain how did they get to ancient Atlantis? How did they right. happen to, you know, how, what are they doing suddenly in the, you know, when, yeah. when like, oh, in the, in the beginning of the pirate story, Simone is, you know, has, has traded a rare comic book for this little boat and then they go off in their little boat and suddenly they're on a pirate adventure. It's like, right. how does that happen? It's like, I don't know, but it just happens. It's just, you go yeah, along for no, the ride. It's, it's not, you know, it's, it's uh, particularly in comedy. It's like, don't, don't waste my time explaining how that works. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I did that in my Elvira comic. There was a lot of science fiction and fantasy elements in it, but I did my damnedest to not explain any of it. Right, right. Certainly never let the explanation get in the way of a joke. No, no, you just have, you know, it's like sometimes, you know, you just have to have fun with it. And, that, and that's the thing that I emphasize, like with, with like Simone and Ajax and a lot of the stuff that I actually write myself, um, you, you know, like whether it was Simone and Ajax or Katie Keene or, or, other, or other things, it's like, I, I like to make fun comics. And I mean, the, you know, the, the, it, and then the world, I mean, these days especially could certainly use some more fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and yeah. you know, the, uh, as like like the like the lady says, the spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. Also, the once you've got them laughing, you can also tell them whatever story, whatever moral, whatever message you want to present. Right, uh, right. And there is occasionally a mess, and there is, you know I will say there is occasionally a little message I'm trying to get across, but I'm not going to be one to hammer it over someone's head. You know, if no. you get it, you get it, and if you don't, and you just have some good time with the jokes, great. Yeah. No, I've talked about that before on this as well. That. Uh, you know, when I wrote the Doc Savage thing, I knew that there's the audience of super fans, small though they may be, that wants Doc Savage, their Doc Savage. But I also wanted a modern audience to be able to get anything out of it. And I had, a, I wrote a story that's centered around essentially a lesbian romance. And it wasn't, 
I mean, it was subtle, but it wasn't that subtle. But I, it kind of went flying over the heads of the people who might get offended by it. They literally went, oh, Amelia Earhart and Pat Savage are just best friends. Best, best pals, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's not what I wrote or what Dave Acosta drew, but... And what was amazing is in the reviews that I read of it of people under 40, they accepted that plot line without blinking. Mm -hmm. Like the first line of those reviews was always, so Doc Savage goes off helping Pat look for her long lost girlfriend, Amelia Earhart. You know, no, no beating around the bush. Uh, whereas to the other audience, that was an extremely secondary part of the narrative if they mm -hmm. even picked up on it. So it's always, whether you intend art to work on multiple levels or not, it invariably will. So you might as well pay attention to that. You know, right. the old Bugs Bunny thing, which what you were talking about is like the jokes for adults, the jokes for children. You know, I always use an example, Wendell Wilkie is a funny sounding name. When I saw the Bugs Bunny cartoon as a kid, where he says, do you think that was a gremlin? And the gremlin shouts, well, it ain't Wendell Wilkie in his head, in his ear. Mm -hmm. It made me laugh. Right. Luckily, I had my father born in 1924 in the room to say, Wendell Wilkie was an unsuccessful presidential candidate against Franklin mm -hmm. Roosevelt. And I went, oh, okay. That is, but it doesn't, it's still funny. Like, if you don't right, know who right. Wendell Wilkie is, it's still, the joke still lands. So, right, anyway, right. with that, That's what I'm hoping is. Uh, thank ahead. you so much for coming on. Thanks for reading yeah. uh, The Spider. I really wanted to get to The Spider since I've... Uh, We've talked about Doc Savage already. I'll, I'll do the shadow soon enough. But yeah. uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, best of the Kickstarter. I'm sure it will be successful. I, I'm, I'm hoping so. This is my very first Kickstarter. So I'm, I'm really, you know, hoping people will at least take a look and give it, give it a shot. And I, I appreciate mean, you having me on here to help get oh, the word out. Of course. Yeah. And it's, it, look, it's such a, it's beautiful work. Uh, I think the, the nice thing, the great thing about a comic book Kickstarter is you can present the art and people can go, wow, that's going to be gorgeous. And I want to see that. So uh, well, again, happy to, get, happy to get the word out on it. Thanks. And you, you, you mentioned the art, but I also want to mention, you know, if you want to get a feeling of what the stories are like too, um, if you go to SimoneAndAjax.com, there's a preview section where you can read the first six pages of each of the two first sto stories in the book that are, are, are completed or about completed. And as I get to the other two, I will be putting up previews there. So I'm hoping, you know, if you, the people, you know, who are like, well, it looks nice, but will I like, will I like it? I'm hoping right. that the opening sequences on each of them will, will help, you know, will help, you know, convince you to put your faith in me because I understand that, you know, I can't, you know, you can't just send me your money and I'm immediately sending you this book. Of it's course. like, you're, you're, you're trusting me. You're, you're, you're buying this book and helping me get it over the hump, get it printed and to you, but that's going to take till spring. Sure. And so I want, I'm, I'm hoping people will, will, you know, feel like, oh, well, okay, yeah, now that I've seen this little bit, yeah. I can, I can, you know, have some faith in this actually happening. Well, and, you know, when you, uh, professionals deliver, uh, and you're, you're a professional, you've been at this a while, I, I, I encountered someone a few weeks ago online who literally said, I, I backed one Kickstarter once, and they never delivered the thing, so I would never, I would never use Kickstarter again. I was like, that's like saying I went to one restaurant once and my dinner was cold, so I will never go to another restaurant. Right. right <laughs> like, yeah, right. don't support that person's Kickstarter again. But there are a lot of diverse people on Kickstarter doing a lot of different projects, and a lot of us deliver on what we promised. Um, right. I mean, yeah, there's so many good projects on Kickstarter. I mean, I, I myself, I mean, I, they, keep, they keep track of how many you've backed, you know, in your mm -hmm. whole profile. And I've backed about 125 Kickstarters. And I think out of those 125, yeah, maybe one didn't deliver, but the other 124 did. So, yeah. you know. And, I, I got to say, I haven't done that many, but I don't think any of them have not delivered. Um, yeah. They've all kind of, the tricky part is finding the time to read them all. That's actually. Right, right. That is, that is always the problem. I mean, but on the other, but I keep seeing these projects. I mean, the, the fun thing about Kickstarter is you get to feel like you're part of making something happen, making someone's dream a reality. And, and some of these stories in here, you know, like in, in Simone and Ajax that are in the new book, some of these stories like the pirate story or the monster story have been stories I've been wanting to tell for 25 or 30 sure. years. I mean, I first, Simone, this is the 30th anniversary of the first appearance of Simone and Ajax. Wow. And, and, um, and like, yeah, if you, if you look at their, 
their first proper comic book story from 1994 in the pages of Ragbop, uh, which was a, an indie book at the time, um, you know, there, there's a little shot of Simone in the pirate costume that is almost the exact same shot I used right. for the opening shot in the pirate story 25 years later. Right. Well, and that's why, you know, there, there was a, this has faded a little bit, but, you know, with the Keanu Reeves thing, it's come up recently and people are, oh, what do these millionaires need to do Kickstarters for? And to a degree, there's a valid point to that, not that you and I are millionaires. No. But <laughs> when I first thought about that, I mean, I used Kickstarter the first time six years ago, seven years ago, something like that, to raise money for a movie that I that did get made and delivered, kids. Uh, but I rem my first thought was, if Kickstarter had existed since the 60s, there would be a dozen more Orson Welles movies. Right, right. Martin Scorsese would have been able to make The Last Temptation of Christ in 1980, and it would have starred Robert De Niro if Kickstarter existed in 1980. Like, there, even people who you think have the golden ticket, we all still want to be free from editorial control. We all still want to make movies the studio doesn't want to give us $10 million to make or a million dollars to make or $100,000 to make. So I begrudge no one going to the public and saying, hey, help me make this thing that I really want to make. Uh, and even if it's a cynical cash grab, you know what? The people who gave the money towards it wanted it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Like well, if they if if they thought it was a cheat or a scam or they didn't want to give the money to someone who's already a rich movie star, they could have chosen to not give. Right. But well, this this is certainly not a cynical cash grab. This is my no, sincere no. most. No, I know, but I'm just yeah. Like, yeah it's, it's, it is the thing I most want to do. And no, us we, we we people in comics, you know, can make a living, but we're we're not rich. And so, you know, I need that money to to help get it printed, to pay Jason the colorist, you know, because Absolutely. He, you know, he's got mouths to feed. You know, I, I want to make sure he gets paid. And uh, you know, I just want you know, and it's like I'm I'm hoping people, you know, once they read over the campaign page, will will get excited about my dream and will, you know, much like I have with other people's campaigns, be excited to want to help make this a reality and, Absolutely. and, 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 and be excited to, to act, you know, you know, even if it takes six months, eventually you get to hold this book in your hands and, and it's like, and hopefully think, wow, this is, I, I helped make this happen. Oh, totally. And yeah. the last thing I'll say about Kickstarter and about, this is particularly about supporting a lot of Kickstarters like you and I do. Here's my favorite thing about it. If you support one Kickstarter, you might be waiting three months, six months, a year in the case of a longer text to get it. If you support 20 or 30 of them a year, it becomes like this thing you subscribe to that you forgot. Because I guarantee, like for me, about once every two weeks, I go to my mailbox and there's a, you know, eight and a half by 11 thing. And I'm like, ah, oh, I wonder what this is. And I rip it off. I was like, oh, right. David Walker's the hated number one. I put money into this seven months ago or whatever it was. And you just, it's like I said, you if you if you back a lot of them, it's like you, you subscribe to Kickstarter and you get a comic you totally forgot you bought right. every two or three weeks. And it's great. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's an endless joy to keep getting these things. And you go, oh, yeah, right. Here's, here's Jason and Ashley's book. This thing looks amazing. So yeah. anyway, with that, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me and helping get the word out. I appreciate it. Absolutely. My pleasure. And we'll talk again soon. Sounds good. Thank you.